five. Well, good afternoon to everyone there. This is the meeting of the Warrington Health and Wellbeing Board. Uh, this is a, uh, a public meeting, so members of the public will, will be tuned into this uh, meeting. Uh, just ask participants in the meeting, please, to um, remain on mute um, while the meeting's on. If you wish to speak, obviously move to mute and uh, keep your cameras on, that will be helpful. If you wish to ask a question uh, and you're on Teams, please use the hand facility. For those of you who are on the telephone, I'll have to uh, manage you coming in to ask, ask a question or make a comment. So make sure people on the telephone are given equal treatment. Uh, when you speak for the first time, just perhaps say who you are, and where you're from, please. That will be helpful. Uh, the meeting is timed to go past three o'clock today. I have another meeting at 2.55, so Rebecca Knowles, Councillor Rebecca Knowles, will take over the chair if we've not concluded our business at that point, colleagues. So just move to the uh, uh, agenda then, please. Any apologies then, please? Uh, yes, we have apologies from Councillor Cathy Mitchell, uh, Councillor Russ Bowden and Councillor Pat Wright. Also from um, David Cooper, Ruth Marie Dales, John McLucky, Mike Larkin, David Keane, and Superintendent Martin Cluer. Okay, thank you. Are there any others, please? Anyone wants to raise? Okay, just mention the code of conduct. If you've got any declaration of interest you wish to declare, um, uh, um, please let Jenny know, please, and we will record those in the appropriate way. Um, the minutes of the last meeting held on the 16th of July. Uh, can I take those, please, as a, as a true record? Would someone like to move the minutes, please? What to say on, sis? Anyone want to move the minutes, please? I'd be yeah. happy to do that. Thank you. So, any matters arising from the minutes? Um, uh, I'll turn to you, Simon Kent. Any matters from the minutes you want to raise, please? Uh, not really, Stephen. Simon Kenton here, Programme Director for Rangers Together. I just wonder, under item 78, Stephen, is there any update about when we're going to get feedback from our submission around the town deal plans? Well, uh, thanks to Lucy from the hospital, we put in a, a very strong submission. It was supported by both of our MPs to government by the 31st of July. That's when it was uh, submitted. We've gone in phase one. Uh, we're hoping to hear uh, good news about us, our, uh, our bid, which is for up to £25 million of resource for a number of projects which were discussed last time and they indeed are in the minutes. We should hear about that, we're, we're hoping, uh, in early October. That's the latest information I have, Simon. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anybody else uh, want to raise any matters from the minutes, please? OK. Um, if then. Uh, Move to Tara Raj, who's uh, joined us from the beginning of August, uh, baptism of fire, Tara. I've asked Tara to say a few words about her background, uh, her aspirations, and uh, she'll also give you a quick update on the COVID situation in the, in the borough as of today. There's a report later in the agenda around situational awareness. So over to you, Tara. Welcome to Warrington. Thank you. Uh, thank you, colleagues. Um, I'm Tara Raj, I joined as Director of Public Health um, at the beginning of August. Um, I wanted to join much earlier. I was um, offered the job at the beginning of March, which you will remember as the heyday of before lockdown. So I found it extremely um, frustrating not to be able to be with you and to be leading um, the, the response and also keeping our eye on health inequalities. But I'm here and um, there's lots of feedback. Is everybody experiencing that as well? I'll carry on. Okay. So there's some interference. OK, I'll, I'll try to be slower. Um, I have a, about 30 years of experience working in public. Now, some people um, have come to it uh, from another discipline. I have always wanted to do this. Um, I've worked locally um, in different parts of the country, including the Midlands, um, uh, Yorkshire, London, and in the Southwest. 
Um, I've worked regionally and I've worked at nationally as well for places like NICE, the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence. So I've always got my eye on, could we be doing things differently, better? Are we getting value for money? Those sorts of things. And that's partly what attracted me to Warrington. Warrington to me is a very committed um, area and borough around how to grow and have sustainable economic development. But whilst keeping its eye on the prize, which is about tackling inequalities, and that combination I think is quite rare. And um, that's why I've, I've joined Warrington to be on that journey. I was out and about yesterday with Councillor Ross Bowden in, in Birchwood, and I could see visibly that parts of Warrington are still growing. Um, and I want to you know, keep that, that happening. We need to keep Warrington open. We need to keep Warrington growing and thriving. Um, and I think um, together we can make that happen. Um, during a pandemic, it's never going to be easy, um, but I'm, I, I want to assure colleagues that actually, um, whilst we do have a pandemic, we do have coronavirus, it's live in our communities. We also have a number of other um, you know, inequalities issues that I am going to be keeping my eye on with your help. Um, so things like mental health um, that affect our, our communities, um, things like schools and education and supporting colleagues to make sure that our education outcomes improve, keep improving. Um, so I, I do have my eye on wider issues, not just on COVID, and that's what I want to assure you about. Um, I'll pause there and just reflect on where we're at with COVID. As you can see, um, the situational awareness report that um, I prepared with Tracy and Flute and Dave Bradburn a week ago, that was the picture that we actually had low numbers. Now, as of today, that picture, well, it's been changing over the last um, week, um, but it's, it's changed particularly today. And um, you'll have seen probably um, already reported that our, um, there are so many numbers to focus on, but I'd like you to focus on one particular number. So um, it's just under 54 um, cases per 100,000. That's our incident rate, and it's been over a 14 day period. So we know that actually we look at that longer period because it gives us an idea as to whether it's up and down data, if cases are going up and down or if it's a sustained increase. So um, that's uh, that's relatively high. I don't want to panic people because um, we've got some national uh, measures coming in that I think will help. Um, but we also need to be mindful that actually we have to um, think beyond that. Um, shall I pause there, Stephen, and we talk talk about COVID more a bit later, or what would be helpful? Um, let's just pause there and just any questions on uh, Charles' introduction or the situation in Warrington, perhaps the mitigation measures that we're going to be possibly taking locally. Talk about that. I'll take any questions first to Tara, please. OK, Tara, perhaps just talk to us about 54 out of 100,000 and uh, some of the, uh, the mitigation measures at local level. We, we, we are considering this. I mean, we're doing them at the moment. We are considering them, aren't we? Yes. Yeah. And um, so we've just come from the uh, I've just been chairing the Holton and Warrington um, Health Protection um, Board, COVID board, which some of you are part of. And we did discuss um, whether we would uh, do more of what we were doing, step up some things and do less of what we were doing. The, the menu of um, possible um, interventions, uh, you know, were borrowed from other areas um, who have gone into local lockdown might include, may or may not, but stepping up on, um, on some of the, uh, you know, targeting some of the premises where we've seen some cases of COVID. Uh, we've already been doing that, but we may look to step that up. Um, we are seeing um, cases rising amongst our younger cohort, although it is amongst all cohorts of all age groups. So we're not going to just focus on young people. We have to sort of think about all, all, all age groups. Um, 
other areas have um, introduced a hotline to um, shop people who are uh, socially distancing. I'm not sure that would be a particularly helpful thing for Warrington. I think we're a very neighbourly um, place to live. Um, however, there is the 101 um, number that is being used um, by communities to report directly on, on, on any kind of concerns. Um, the other things uh, that some of our NHS colleagues are looking at is what we might step up and step down in terms of um, trying to get some of the recovery services together. Uh, we don't want to press the button on, um, on uh, reinstigating some of the services, but that will have to be looked at. Um, some of the other options that we're considering are, um, is there something more about our, um, our, uh, you know, the messages that we need to get out um, around visitors to care homes and hospitals? We don't feel that we want to stop people from um, visiting care homes and hospitals. It still needs to be a case by case basis. So um, there are, that's just a, a very quick summary of some of the things that we have been looking at that other areas have implemented. Um, there is no easy um, off the shelf answer, but um, I think together we need to think about how we keep growing the economy, how we don't shut um, Warrington down, how we make sure that we're targeting the messages at, um, at people who are probably a little bit fed up um, of being told what to do and how to live. So it's more of the softly, softly approaches <coughs> Um, working through our community and um, communities and neighbourhoods teams, uh, working through our lead members um, about how we promote the softly, softly messages, um, but reinforcing the, I think it's a space, uh, keep your space, keep your distance, uh, keep washing your hands um, and, you know, making sure that you are going for testing if, you, if you've got signs and symptoms. Um, I'll pause there. Uh, did you want me to mention the testing? Um, yeah. an outbreak situation, Stephen. Yes, okay. back in a second, please. Any comments now? The, the HAM facility on live teams doesn't, doesn't, uh, is not available. So I just have to manage it as best I can, please. Does anybody want to contribute or any raise any issues from Tara's presentation? I'd just like to come in, first of all, Stephen, it's Thank Maureen you. here. Um, just to thank Tara for the work she's doing and, and, and uh, I've obviously welcomed her and we've had some useful initial chat since she started and you're right it's baptism of fire was straight in with numbers going up and, and how we manage that um, but um, I know that it's good that Tara has that real interest in the marmot principles in the inequalities and the mental health that we you know we so care about in Warrington um, but also looking at the specific numbers that I, I have confidence that the team have got a really close eye on this and that we're working together to get the right answers for our town and make sure we do the right things at the right time. So there's some very strong messaging, making sure people really understand what they're being asked to do. Um, but I know the team are keeping a very close eye on the numbers and doing everything they can to, to get the right answers for the town. Okay, thanks, uh, Maureen. Any other comments, please, colleagues? OK, now we did encounter some difficulties yesterday around testing, didn't we? And people referring uh, for the test service. But I just want to summarise what's happened and what mitigation measure we have in place for testing. Yeah, yeah. and and just just reflecting on, um, you know, in me, in, in appointing me as your director of public health, I am used to managing um, infections, outbreaks. So, you know, I do know how to do this in practice and um, I've been doing this. Um, so whenever there's been an outbreak in Warrington and some of you have seen um, them reported in the newspaper, um, myself and the team and others have been uh, calling incident meetings and managing those specific um, outbreaks. Um, it's, um, we actually had um, a, a, an outbreak meeting in relation to one of our hospitality venues earlier in the week um, and we spent quite a lot of time thinking about what we need to do and one of the things was to be able to divert the testing capacity to so that anyone who had signs and symptoms from that outbreak had a local place to go to. You'd think it was fairly straightforward and so we, we diverted the mobile testing unit 
um, to Warrington and um, Stephen agreed that we could host it in Orford at short notice. So that's been in place um, for two days and um, you know, it's the third day. And um, anyone who's tried to get there from Warrington um, has been told to go to places like Telford, anywhere but Warrington. And that has been very difficult because we know how to manage outbreaks. We know the communities, even though I'm new to, to Warrington, I work with people who know communities like um, Maureen and Rebecca and others. It's been very difficult without having the resources that you need in a timely and um, yeah, in a timely way, um, because we know what to do and it's hampering our progress. A little bit disappointing, but we're we're trying to get to the bottom of it. And Stephen um, has escalated it, um, and uh, we're hoping that there'll be some resolution. No, the issue seems to be not the availability of test colleagues. It's it's the capacity in the laboratories where the tests go. Is that correct, uh, Tara? Well. It, it, that's what we've we've been um, we've been given as, as the reason. Um, I still don't understand why you would have to go to Telford because that to me doesn't make any sense. If it doesn't make sense to me, it probably doesn't make sense to our communities. Yeah. Okay. Any other comments then, please? Questions? Steve, um, yep. Paul Warburton. Um, hi, Paul. Sarah. Nice to meet you. Um, I'm a councillor for Chapelford and Old Hall. Uh, and I'm also on health overview and scrutiny. I'm just wondering regarding the the, the track and trace um, and whether or not it's it's um, doing better in Warrington than it is doing nationally. Do you have any comments on that? Yeah, I, I think it's about about average. Um, it's not doing better. We're not doing better or worse in Warrington. Um, that's not a necessarily a good picture to be in. However, I will say that. Um, we know that uh, people are being contacted by the national test and trace system. Um, it's just when it develops as an outbreak situation, they don't necessarily get involved. And um, you know, it's that bit that uh, we, that's why um, our local public health team with others have had to fill in some of the gaps because of that slight disconnect between the national system uh, when it becomes an outbreak and um, you know trying to sort of plug the gaps. So no different to anywhere else, unfortunately. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thanks, Anyone else, please? Yeah, just a oh. comment from me, Stephen, on the um, the uh, testing and people being sent to Telford, which I think is a complete nonsense. Um, and it's very worrying. And I hope that we can get to the bottom of this very quickly because you've got two choices then, haven't you? If you're asked to have a COVID test is do I drive all the way to Telford um, when I might not be feeling well or um, where I might have to stop at a service station on the way, um, even though I've been told to self isolate or do I just not bother? And we need people to get the tests and we have a local testing centre. So this needs sorting out very quickly. I know you're on it, um, Stephen, and I hope we get an answer very soon. OK, thanks. Stephen, it's Just Simon Constable here. May, may I ask a question? Yes, please, Sarah. Hi, Simon Constable, Chief Executive at the, at the hospital. Can I just ask Tara, just, I think this is a really important question, is, is, is whether it's a, uh, an, an issue with testing kit and laboratory capacity or staff testing capacity, because um, both of those, there must be a local solution to it, surely, and that's where we need to um, uh, help each other out under those circumstances. Yeah, I think it's a very helpful question, Simon. We'll try to get to the bottom of it um, because the data that we're seeing and the, the responses we're getting don't help us to answer that question yet. OK, thank you. OK, thank you. Anyone else? Comment. Rebecca, if I may. Yeah, please, Rebecca, please. Hi Tara, without straying into unduly political territory, um, you, I mean, you started off by saying you're an expert in um, infection control and, and sort of monitoring of disease and of course you are, that's the whole point of uh, public health professionals isn't it? And uh, I, I think you know with, with the part that you went on to, to discuss, 
really we need to remind ourselves that the the most agile work is done locally with people who understand local populations and, and the territory on the ground uh, and i think that really feeds in with what simon has just said about uh, trying to find some local solutions here where we can um i, I, I hope you find as you uh, get your feet properly under the table that there, there are um some good cooperative relationships locally and that everybody can pitch in with those as, as best they possibly can to make sure that the bits of it that we have control over locally we, we do our best to continue to try and get right where, wherever we possibly can but uh, I, I think it's it's difficult isn't it this interface between what's happening locally between the local organizations and the stuff that is happening much more remotely with with sort of central control and command at the moment i don't really need you to make that much of a response to that because it does get political but uh, but clearly that's the um some of the texture to the to the situation at the moment i just wanted to, that that reminded me about the collaboration that i've observed locally and i did want to say thank you to eileen omara who has stepped in um while you were waiting for, for a dph to come in so for me that that really speaks volumes about the camaraderie that there is um in this area okay thanks tara any further comments questions please okay tara well welcome to you and uh, thank you. just thank everybody on the call and uh, being in partnership for all the uh, all the endeavours in the last five months. It's shown that we are a team in Warrington. Uh, we've dropped our silos. We've found new ways of working and somehow we need to bottle that going forward. Um, it's been a real good team effort so far and we'll have to continue it for some time. Uh, move on down the agenda then, please. Uh, move to item uh, 5A, Integrated Commission Transformation Board update. So that's with you, Kath Jones, please. Good afternoon everyone, I'm Catherine Jones, I'm the um, Director of Adult Social Care and um, this afternoon I'm just providing you with an update on the work of the Integrated Commissioning and Transformation Board. Uh, that's the team that oversees a lot of the development work across the system and I co-chair that with um, Carl Marsh from the CCG, who is who is on this call and will probably add in. We, we're a bit of a, a, a double act, so I'll say some bits and then uh, um, I'm sure Carl will will come in at the end. Um, so really, I think the key theme that I wanted to express was that the uh, Integrated Commissioning and Transformation Board has been really working together through the COVID period in particular um, to have a very much a joined up approach to prioritising and allocating um, the work and particularly the financial resources to meet the main objectives, which have been about keeping our vulnerable people safe and well at home in the community and also wherever possible, keeping the flow through hospital and acute services so that the most unwell people can be cared for. Um, having gone through the last five months, ICTB are now concentrating on what we're calling reset and phase two of COVID planning. Um, we have um, the Better Care Fund Steering Group reports into ICTB and the Better Care Fund Steering Group is where a lot of the joint work, a lot of the integrated work and the funding for that, uh, that is where decisions are made. And similar to a lot of the other areas um, across the council, uh, the Better Care Fund, which we call BCF, had paused some of the core work when COVID hit. However, the agenda has now been reset. The scheme evaluations that we look at have been resumed. Terms of reference have been refreshed and work on the, sec the joint section 75 agreements is recommencing. We've also been specifically looking at some schemes such as a good neighbour pilot scheme. And this has come off the back of really the tremendous work that was done by the Safe and Well scheme during COVID. As that comes to an end, I think it's really important and it has really demonstrated the impact on people's well-being of isolation. And this scheme in particular is looking to support the collective approach to living and ageing well and minimising the Im impact of that isolation. 
Um, we've also been, we're also specifically continuing to fund some work with the British Red Cross uh, for support at home for the next six months and linking that very closely to the work of our community rapid response service. So the focus is now on our priority investment areas in the Better Care Fund that we developed in 2019-20. And we had three big themes, which we call the big ticket items, which were about developing an integrated rapid community response service, which we have set up and we've had an ad a, the additional input of 1.3 million accelerator site monies to do that. Also on redesigning our intermediate tier services, both our bed based and, com and, and community based services, because we want to make sure that they are fit for the future and providing some additional enhanced reablement support, which is very much about providing wraparound packages of care for people in the community. Uh, and determining going forward what the investment needs are beyond 2021. Um, it was actually agreed that we would have one finance work stream with standard reporting requirements feeding into ICTB that's going to provide financial oversight and direction for both Better Care Fund, IBCF and Warrington Together budgets. Because I think one of the things that we uh, that has really happened as a result of COVID, and I know uh, Dr Davies is coming on to talk about that, is that we've been able to really pull together as a system and moving on from that, what we're proposing to do is streamline the governance arrangements across the system between health, the providers and the council to progress that work of directing more work through ICTB where we already have mature partnership working and it's it's working very well. Um, so uh, uh, other things that are, 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 are we're, we're focusing on now as a result of national guidance, there's been a lot of uh, papers come out from government regarding hospital guidance and requirements for what's called discharge to assess. Uh, and we're looking at how we implement that going forward. And that's very much about trying to ensure that we uh, support people out of hospital because we know that that's not the best place for them once they're medically optimised so that we can assess people out of an acute environment, that we can turn around our assessments as soon as possible and also deliver a seven day service. So we're working on that and there's also been significant progress and feedback around the, the winter plan. So uh, I was just thinking, the, oh, the other thing that I did just want to say was, I think this week marks the last week um, of work for Chris Evans, the Chief um, uh, Operating Officer at Warrington um, and Holton Hospital Trust. And um, I did just want to say on behalf of the system, uh, a really big thank you to Chris. We wish him all yeah. the best going forward and it's actually been um, it's been incredibly helpful to work together as a system and Chris has been really uh, formative in supporting that work that positive work going forward. Um, uh, Carl um, I just wonder if you'd like to come in and say something about the winter plan and NHS 111. I, I will. You've, you've not left me much to talk about, but I, I will quickly talk about that. But firstly, I'd like to echo your thanks to uh, Chris. He, he's been part, although not on ICTB, he's been a, a fundamental part in the system working together. And the, and the, and the, you and I were talking about this yesterday, and I, we will both miss him, I think. Uh, but, but look forward to working with his replacement. The thing I, I was struck about, Kath, when you were talking was that at the start of the pandemic, one of the things that we did so that we could really focus on escalation was we folded down ICTB and the BCS. And, and that was one of the key bits of architecture where we do come together. And, and I think we realised quite early on that we, we needed to rein, uh, reinstate that, which we did quickly. And we're able to start getting our heads together to, to come up with joint solutions to the challenges we face. And, and, and I think the key thing we've been able to do is give support and oversight to things like the winter plan. And our winter plan has just been published. It was assured by our, our regulators. Uh, it, it's real and it, it's, it's hard won over, over the last three or four, uh, four, four years. And, and key things within that, such as NHS Treble One First, that we've been supportive of at ICTB. And I know that Simon Constable is going to talk about later and also our successful bid to be a pilot 
which has funding around a rapid community response service, which is really helping us to get an understanding of how we support people to remain independent. Um, and I think also as well, aligned to that is a piece of work that we are sponsoring through the uh, Improve Better Care Fund funding around uh, the Intermediate Care, Care Services Review, which will be most welcome when it is uh, published. I, I think that's all I've got to uh, to add there, Cass. Thanks, uh, Carl. So any comments or questions, colleagues, please? Steve, it's Simon here. Thank you, Simon. Simon just, just to uh, just to pick up really on the, the, the kind words of, of Kath uh, and Carl with regards to Chris Evans, uh, who leaves us tomorrow. Um, uh, thank you for that, and I will make sure that I will pass those on. I suppose the, the, the point I wanted to make to this uh, board this afternoon is that um, whilst um, you know that leadership um, has gone from Chris's perspective, it's, it's certainly not person specific, and we will give absolute assurance to the uh, board that uh, that will be carried on and is organisation specific and is not dependent on a certain individual and we'll carry on that good work and there's a very strong team in place that want to make sure that that happens. Okay, thanks. Sir Simon, other comments then please? It's Rebecca here. Um, I, I think I've described elsewhere that the uh, ICTB has been cooking on gas as a relatively um, new um, sort of agglomeration of people. It, it's been phenomenal, really, the way that's sort of meshed together and stepped up. And um, the amount of sort of business as usual stuff um, that, that is so important that has uh, carried on um, being formulated on top of all the other things that have been thrown at it. So when you were talking before, Stephen, about, um, you know, the, the, the bits that have worked really well and, and um, the, the silos that have been sort of um, sloughed off from 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 people's uh, mindsets and ways of working. I think the ICTB is a really good sort of model for for, for that and really illustrates that process. So um, I, I think it's really heartening actually this, the sort of medium term stuff that uh, that Kath uh, that, that's been mentioned uh, and and that Carl's mentioned things like the integrate the work on integrated care that that was. Uh, starting to sort of crank up before COVID. Uh, I, th there are lots of exciting things in the pipeline that, are, that really should make a, a, a huge difference to um, to the way the whole system works. So uh, lots and lots of good work and lots of hard work. Um, you know, as, as a lay person attending those kind of meetings, it's um, there's an awful lot to keep up with and a lot to read because of the pace of work that's going on. But that the shared commitment um, to coming up with workable, effective, rapid solutions, it has been really impressive. So uh, hats off um, to uh, everybody who's participated in that, definitely. Yeah, thanks, Rebecca. Anyone else, please? OK, well, th thanks for the report, Kath. Uh, <coughs> there are two Chris Evans in my life now in uh, Warrington. I much prefer the health version to the earlier version, the health and wolf. <laughs> but, uh, um, Thank you. If we move now on to uh, the reports from Andy Davis on uh, Warrington Together. So Andy, please. Chair, sure, it's, uh, it's Carl. Um, I'm, I'm, Andy, I think Andy spoke to you beforehand. Yeah. Andy is trying to try and join us, uh, but it's been held up. Yeah. So we could push this further back. Yeah, I'll, do, I'll, I'll, do, I'll do that. I'll do that, Carl. I'll push it a bit further down the agenda. And he okay. did speak to me about his uh, time of being here. So move yeah. then to item uh, 5B2, uh, COVID system re response phase three, please. That's you, Simon Kenton. Simon, are you with us? Simon Kenton. OK, in which case I'll move on to uh, uh, item number six, living well. Um, uh, uh, Simon, are you back with us? I am, I am trying to unmute. Right, OK, there we go. Right. So we'll go back to item uh, 5B2, phase three response, Simon, please. Can you hear me? Yeah, I hear you fine. Right, OK, sorry about that, Chair. 
Um, this was a draft submission that we've been requested to uh, put into the system via the Cheshire and Merseyside Health and Care Partnership, which as colleagues will know represent the nine places across Cheshire and Merseyside. This was the first submission that we had to submit and relates to a narrative. Um, the other submissions which are forthcoming are to do with performance, finance, health inequalities and workforce. Um, this has been uh, around the system, so hopefully it rep represents a collective approach. Um, and although we were fettered into submitting something which was purely NHS and health, hopefully the first three pages does emphasise the work that Warrington's together has been doing and has been acknowledged in relation to collaboration, prevention and population health. Um, there are some typos in that, but we have until the 21st to correct those. It was a very um, rigid template that we had to uh, respond to. So can I take the opportunity to thank the CCG for helping us to respond to these? And you see it's quite a comprehensive list around what we as a system are going to do under phase three of recovery under COVID. Chair, I, I'm not prepared. I'm not um, preparing to uh, spend any longer in relation to the detail of the submission. Suffice to say, we have until the 21st to make any changes. Um, so I'll, I'll leave that there for colleagues to consider and to let me know if they're happy with the draft submission and any comments to include in the next iteration. Thank you. OK, any comments, please? Uh, yes, Stephen, it's Ian here, Councillor Ian Marks. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, fire away Ian, please. Uh, yes, thanks Simon. I was intrigued to see on page 45, there's a section called Key Assumptions Underpinning Plans. Um, referral levels will continue to increase back to normal. Uh, no further local national lockdown. Staff sickness and does not increase. No material impact from Brexit. Voluntary sector organisations continue to operate in Warrington. Now, I'm sure the latter ones, it will be fine, but one or two of those others I'm a bit concerned about because I don't think that how, some of those are really very realistic. So well, they're the assumptions that we're making. We, we haven't been able to quantify the material impact of Brexit, but we needed to flag those up because our assumptions are made on the assumption that there will be none of those uh, points ahead. So we're not we're not commenting on that. We're just chronicling that these are issues which um, will have a material impact in relation to our ability to fulfil our commitments as we submitted. So no, I, I understand that, Sam. It's very difficult for you. It's just that I feel that some of those probably aren't too realistic. But I understand the constraints you're working under. Okay, thank yeah. you. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, without getting diverted from our mission this afternoon, Ian, we, we are going to have to consider uh, the implication to Brexit on a whole series of issues affecting the borough going forward. And I've created the, I've restood up the Brexit advisory group of the council in order to do that uh, very, very recently. Yeah, can I ask a question, Stephen? Yeah, please, Maureen. Um, it's just about that there's an excellent focus on prevention, which I know has always been something that we've been trying to focus on, and it, it's it's really good that that's a key part of this. Um, what happened since the last Health and Wellbeing Board is that there's been a decision to abolish Public Health England. Um, do we have we got any idea how that's going to affect our plans, or is it too early to say? Um, well, we're, we're unaware, I mean, Tara might be able to help me in this, around the functions which were hitherto fulfilled by um, Public Health England. We know the track and trace has gone to a separate organisation. I think there's still a debate about where things like uh, um, addiction uh, prevention will land. I think there are four options which Matt uh, Hancock is looking at, but I think it's too early to, to settle on uh, the uh, impact on Warrington. OK, Tara, do you want to comment, please, Tara? Yes, I think um, the impact on Warrington has already been felt um, in that there is um, a considerable concern um, and that obviously doesn't make for good um, forward planning. Um, so I mentioned that 
COVID is one part of the job that I'll be looking at and all the other parts that Public Health England have been focusing on and helping in terms of corralling and coordinating local efforts um, is an unknown quantity. So uh, we need clarity sooner rather than later because it's hard to do all of that without that coordination and support from Public Health England. Um, so I am no clearer about the path uh, forward on those on those other areas. I do know um, I have been, um, along with other directors of public health, have been meeting with um, the chief medical officer on a regular basis, have been meeting with um, Dido Harding and Michael Brody, who's, um, so Dido is leading the NHS, um, the new National Institute for Health Protection, and um, Michael Brody is leading the sort of PHE uh, body that's going to reform into, um, you know, to, to do all the other aspects. But um, I have no more clarity at the moment. I think Simon, you're a spot on. Okay, thanks, Tara. Can I Can come I back on that? Yeah, please, uh, Maureen, yeah. Yeah, no, it, it's not an unsurprising answer from Ty, uh, Tara and Simon. I think, um, I suppose the thing that, that's always in my the forefront of my mind, and I know several people echo this, is that the prevention work we do is actually helping um, to support people who are who are struggling with the same issues that that have that COVID affects. So a lot of the prevention work would help people suffering from uh, who who might might contract COVID, and um, and I suppose Public Health England has been in the spotlight because of COVID. But all, all the time before that, a lot of that prevention work was being done that people didn't know about, and it's something that we really wanted to step up and, and do more of. And it's the bit that has been chronically underfunded too. We've, you know, the, the funding for public health prevention work has been gradually uh, removed over several years now. Um, and yet it, it's a key part of what we want to do. And we'll keep that focus, but it'd be good to get um, something positive to say that, that we are going to get that properly funded and, and properly organised nationally. Okay, thank you, Maureen. It's a related um, question regarding health inequalities and prevention. And um, I see that the uh, nominated lead is um, is Andrew Davis. And um, I think you know, Andrew does a fantastic job as a, as a GP. Uh, and also the um, health equality champions um, are also from uh, GPs from the CCG. And I'm just wondering whether or not um, as GPs, they are best placed to be um, champions for um, primary prevention and uh, inequalities. And it might be a, a discussion that's uh, required outside this this um, this board. But um, by the time we've got to a GP, the um, the issue has occurred. And um, from a prevention point of view, there may be other people that would be available and perhaps somebody um, such as the, the social prescribers or somebody such as that. Um, that would be able to be a better place to be healthy quality champions and then able to tackle the inequalities better rather than busy GPs who are also um, involved with um, uh, lots of other clinical and non-clinical issues. Okay, Paul. The thing I'd like to do with that, Paul, I'll just take offline a conversation with you and Tara to begin with, obviously then with Andy Davis from the CCG. And we'll bring that back as a note next time to the meeting. That'd be okay. That's fine. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Paul. Anyone else on this report then, please? OK, well, can I thank you very much, uh, Simon, for the report. If we go back to Andy Davis, who tells me by text he was trying to contribute and produce the report, but couldn't, nobody could hear him. Andy, you want to try again, please? Right. Yeah. Sorry, Chair, it's Jenny from Democratic Services. Um, Andy, perhaps if, if you try pressing star six, that should unmute your line. Right, I'll move on there, colleagues. If I move then to uh, uh, the item on the thematic update on living well. So we've got Anne-Marie Carr from uh, Families and Wellbeing. So, Amory, please. Oh. 
I know Anne Marie is on the call, she's on the telephone. Just wait for Anne Marie. <clears throat> Anne Marie, if you try and press star six on your telephone, that should unmute you. If we're if we're having problems with Anne Marie, shall I take us through this? Um, yes, please, Doris. Should yes, or should we come back to it? Is that all right, Stephen? Give. Yeah, what what do you do? Don't mind, dear colleagues. I'll come back to uh, item six as well. In the meantime, we'll see if we can get people to uh, deal with their telephones. So, move to item seven on situational awareness of COVID. Then, uh, thank you. Thank you, Tara. Super. Um, so uh, on, on the, um, I think I already alluded to um, what had been happening um, in Warrington. So as you can see, a, a week is a long, is a long time in COVID uh, land. Um, what I think, uh, I wasn't sure whether to do a, do this verbally or in a written format, but um, the written format, which you'll have read and seen, actually shows all of the work that colleagues um, in, in this um, meeting and beyond, including the local public health team, the education team, the housing team, the environmental health team, have all been working on. So I'm hoping that you have um, been able to digest the report. Um, it, it talks about um, the, the leadership um, that has been um, very, very prominent in Wellington in order to keep those cases low. And they have been keep, kept low for a considerable amount of time. Uh, you'll see in the report that there's a reference to all of the food parcels. Now, food parcels that were given to people who were shielded, that's only part of what that team did. They, they gave uh, that sort of um, hand-holding support, although you couldn't actually hold people's hands, um, that sort of connectedness. Uh, for very, very vulnerable people who are being asked to stay away from everyone. It's much more than food parcels. Um, you can see in the report that uh, frontline workers really did go over and beyond, uh, and, and including many of my council and colleagues who, you know, they didn't have overtime or anything like that. They just gave up their, their weekend, evenings, and bank holidays and holidays. Um, You'll see in the report that we do um, under um, uh, section two that we have very robust um, surveillance systems in place. Um, Councillor McLaughlin referred to that earlier. We do on a daily basis have reasonably good data now, um, including um, some timely data on when there is an outbreak. Um, so that really has helped our situation locally. Um, so at the time of writing, as I said, the incidence was much lower. Uh, now it is higher. Um, just uh, it's, it's uh, precisely 53.4 per 100,000, um, just under 54 um, per 100,000 over that 14 day period. Um, we, uh, we, we think that the hospitalisation rates are not necessarily spiking at this time, but um, we would hope it wouldn't be that that kind of um, immediacy anyway. And Simon and colleagues are on the phone to be able to say if they're noticing anything different. But um, as far as we're aware, we haven't seen any um, of the data coming through around increased hospitalisations. They've gone up a little bit, um, and the same with with deaths. Um, we've all, I've already talked about the testing um, issues. Um, you know, we do actually um, have. Uh, we are able to host testing um, facilities and since um, the discussion earlier, Simon Constable has emailed me to say, is there anything we can actually do um, now around testing? So you can see that the commitment around the table is there to make the testing work. Um, we have set up a local outbreak management office within the council. Now that has been uh, very stretched. Um, as a resource and we're still recruiting to that. Um, it's actually quite difficult to, to do that recruitment quickly. 
um, we have had quite a lot of um, cases uh, sent our way, um, and, but not many cases that the test and trace service hasn't been able to pick up. So in, all, in you know, linking back to the question I was asked earlier, how is the test and trace system working? Well, when it hasn't worked, we get told um, we haven't been able to get hold of this case. Can you help? And those numbers haven't been huge to date, but we think that they will get bigger and bigger as the number of cases get bigger and bigger. Um, in terms of our preparedness and governance, we still have the um, joint Holton and Warrington Health Protection Board, which you know is working well. Uh, we had the meeting earlier today um, and uh, the next one we're going to do um, a, a run through um, you know, exercise on how we might implement uh, certain parts of uh, you know, further restrictions over a very short period of time. Um, we've got an excellent communications team within Warrington. Um, many of you know Lawrence and Claire and, uh, and others. Um, they're fantastic and they, they produce some really targeted communications. They work with um, the comms teams in the, in the CCG, with the voluntary sector where, where there can be um, you know, benefits of doing that and wider um, partners including Public Health England and you'll see that whenever there is an outbreak or some kind of um, newsworthy story we're constantly being um, able to, to reply and respond so that people are not kept in the dark. So I think there is a spirit of transparency um, behind our media approach as well as much more softly and um, softer communications. Um, we have, um, you know, we, 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 we've worked with uh, the Warrington Wolves, uh, who are um, great allies locally, to try and promote, um, you might not have seen those lovely pictures, they are at the end of the report, about keeping, um, keeping um, you know, keeping apart and using the wolfy um, symbol and, uh, and uh, you know, mascot. As a, as a visual aid about how to keep it, keep apart. Um, so whilst uh, whilst I'm I'm uncomfortable to say, um, you know, we 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 uh, we're in a worse place. We are than when it when the report was written. However, I wouldn't want us to panic and start to do things that could have an adverse um, consequence. You know, we, we have to be mindful that people do need to be supported. So I see that our job as the Health and Wellbeing Board is to support communities to tackle COVID and to tackle it together rather than imposing lots of top down messages and um, quite uh, draconian um, sorts of um, you know, uh, sticks. Um, so I think we need to think about our approach going forward um, we've tried um, softer messaging, that seems to be working very well. Um, that community approach is the one that we should be going for. Um, we probably do need to step up our outreach work in high risk areas. So when we know that there are gatherings um, to be more visible, um, it's difficult to do that with the resources we have, but we, we are looking at those sorts of options. Um, I'm going to pause there. Um, so whilst um, we are high, um, we're not panickingly high. However, the trajectory is upwards. So um, within the next week, we may actually be in a critical stage. We may not be, but um, I didn't want you to feel that um, I was keeping anything back. But um, the unvalidated data um, it seems to be um, looking like we're going upwards, um, not downwards. So not in a good place, um, not in panic mode. We never panic. We try and think about the pragmatic solutions that we've got to hand and how we can act together and sensibly. Thank you. So, Tara, before I take any questions, Simon, from the hospital side, anything you want to say about situation we've had ourselves in the last two weeks, Simon. No, so thank you. Thank you, Steve. So um, so I can confirm uh, currently we've got three uh, positive COVID-19 patients in hospital and none in critical care. For the last couple of weeks, 
um, we we have been in in single figures and indeed less than a handful of, of patients in terms of, of, of numbers with COVID-19. Uh, so uh, I'm aware that there is an increase in numbers across hospitals across the northwest, um, but we have not yet, fortunately, seen that uh, impact upon us uh, in Warrington. Okay, thank you, Simon. Um, any other comments from anyone, please? Uh, yeah, yes, Stephen, it's Ian again. Ian, please, yeah. Uh, yeah, just a question about communications with the public. I mean, I looked at my Warrington Guardian today and I read about the White Heart and a problem at school about sort of an outbreak. And I know there's a lot of stuff on social media which you can't necessarily always trust. But I'm just wondering, um, I mean, I know it's a difficult area of this, but how do, if a member of the public wants to know where the outbreaks are, some of the figures that Simon's been talking about, again, which we can see in the media, because the Warrington Guardian only comes out once a week. I know there's the online, but I mean, what is the central repository for sort of communications? Where should the, the public, the, a member of the public wants to know who should, he, who should he or she contact? Is it the council? Is it the NHS? Who is it? And is it all held together in, in, in one spot or not? Hey, Tara, please. I'll unmute. Um, so uh, I think in terms of the current picture, um, we we get um, we get va unvalidated data um, before it's published um, and validated by Public Health England or nationally. So unfortunately, we can't release that unvalidated data because it could be wrong. Um, however, I think we, we need to be a little bit smarter about perhaps um, a bit like you have a temperature check. Um, you know, maybe on a thermometer on a wall or something. So we'll, I'll, we'll take that back. It's been on my thinking as well, uh, Councillor Marks, about how we um, make it a little bit more easier for somebody to go, oh, well, I can find it on the council website or I can find it on the NHS website. Very okay, helpful. That's great. Thank you very much, Tara. Any other comments, please, please, to, to Tara? I'd like to come in briefly, Stephen. Yeah. Um, Echoing everything that Tara said, I, I think what I'd like to just add to that is, is that the majority of Warrington residents have worked really, really hard since March to really make sure they're following the guidelines. Um, and I know at this stage when lockdown is lifting, um, more things are becoming available to people that it's it might seem that it's OK to relax and people are getting quite tired. Um, but I just wanted to say really that you know, Warrington has shown, Warrington people have shown what they can do and what, what they're made of. And we need to keep keep on with that and, and not be too tired. COVID hasn't gone away. Um, we're working out ways of reopening the town safely. But at the same time, those measures need to still be adhered to. And I think the majority of people are doing that. It just needs that extra messaging that we're doing to keep, keep getting that message out. And obviously there's new restrictions coming in on Monday. Um, which I know a lot of people be disappointed with, but again, it's about adhering to that because we want to get through this winter safely and we want to keep our numbers down as much as possible. Thank you, Maureen. Any further comments then, please? OK, can I thank you very much for your reports and uh, your reassurance, but no complacency here. OK, thank you. Moving back now to, um, uh, I think Andy Davis is able to join us now, so uh, the one you get the report. There you go, Andy. Nice to hear from you. Really nice to hear Can from you. Can you hear me? Brilliant. So yeah. I managed to log into Teams, so I was slightly behind. So I'm shouting at the screen. You can't hear me, and the audio was slightly behind anyway. So there we go. Um, Sorry about that, Chair, and um, that's me not reading the instructions, um, I confess wholeheartedly. Um, so thank you for, uh, let me introduce this paper. It's an early draft and basically it follows on from a conversation that I had with uh, lead officers across uh, the system. So the aforementioned Chris Evans uh, managed to contribute um, as well as Kath and other people. And I've tried to protect uh, the names of the innocent. Well, there are a few names left in there, but hopefully in a positive light uh, during the paper. What what the focus was, was a, a, a point in time where we had the opportunity re to reflect on how we do things forward uh, during COVID uh, and being mindful of the fact that we, we seem to have smashed down some walls that we were uh, sort of getting stuck on and, and wanted to understand that really uh, in a bit more detail from the perspective of the people that we uh, charged with with delivering the vision 
and uh, they've, they've captured the reflections there under the under the headings and the tables and, and they're not verbatim comments but they're pretty much uh, as they were said uh, looking at what's been different what the benefits um, what's the most important of those benefits that you want to see preserved and which bits of the old ways of working do you miss? And that was because we were sort of quite aware that some things that we were doing might have stopped and we might need to bring them back. And then finally, some uh, big three things that we should be focusing on going forward. Um, and I'm not going to read through those comments because I think they stand uh, as other people's words, really. And that, that led me to start thinking about how do we... Uh, capture that how do we how do we start going forward and I've, uh, in the our common purpose section of the paper which is on uh, page 26 of the, 26 of the pack uh, we put forward some headings there of, of, of areas that need a bit of focus and they're not to suggest that those are the answers but it, it seems like a reasonable way forward for me so uh, bringing commission providers close together um, I suppose we, we, during COVID, we, we removed the divide in terms of that commissioner role, more contracting really, um, and looked at what are the skill sets that we have amongst the individual teams and how do we bring those skills, knowledge, expertise and organisational resources to bear on common problems. And that's been really uh, impactful in bringing change. And that, that is something that definitely we need to preserve. Um, democratic representation to decision making. Uh, we've had brilliant conversations throughout COVID, uh, regular updates, and I'm just an honest back and to outside of some of the formal set pieces we do, uh, which I've personally found very helpful, and hopefully colleagues have as well uh, at, at, on, on the other side of that conversation. And, and again, coming back to what we've been doing on the ICTV, I think Maureen and um, Rebecca have been present there. And as much as they appreciate the efforts that are going on, I think they do help provide that touchstone um, that keeps everybody on track and motivated. So thank you to them for their efforts through, through this difficult uh, sort of period as well. Um, address the Warrington Together vision. That for us is a way of being and a promise that we've made. And we, we tended to run it as a, a project and program separate, and that was necessary to get things moving. But I think we now need to start thinking about how do we make that our raison d'etre across uh, all of our agencies for the town uh, to deliver on that, and, and how do we pull together the threads of work that we have that might try to pull us away from there. Sustainability, without us having sustainable services, and that is a challenge for us uh, in the borough, and I know um, a lot of effort in, in, in our provider colleagues in terms of managing costs, trying to do more with less, um, how do we align all that together uh, and maintain a focus on that to maintain our delivery for the people that we serve? And also um, the transformational projects. And those are things that Carl alluded to, are the things that we look at as end-to-end -end pathways where our performance would indicate we've got an opportunity to do better. So that, th those are the main themes that came out of that conversation. I'm not going to go through the second page, which were the successes. Uh, there are more. There's a later draft that we can uh, add more and obviously circulate that and keep it alive. Um, uh, the diagram figure two, um, which I think is actually figure one in this version, but uh, on page 28, what that tries to allude to is that we've got a set of town plans that we uh, are well developed and they are, again, another set of promises and, and conversations that have happened with the public that we serve. So how do we bring together the Warrington Together vision, our sustainability uh, work and the transformational programmes that we've got? And it, it seemed logical for me that we've already got a well-functioning ICTB, but what we're, we're perhaps not doing is bringing through some of those sustainability issues. It gets reported too, but we're not sort of connecting it in the right way at the moment. Uh, and, and the Warrington Together piece has become much more integrated into that. So if we put all of those um, common areas of work under one umbrella, we could really get traction on, the, our, on those three areas that are, are, are mutually beneficial to get progressed. And that, that was the theory. So the suggested next steps that I've captured, and again, I won't go through each of those, but ultimately that that infers a set of tasks. And they, again, these aren't landed as solutions, but they are suggestions about what we need to consider. So, and I think some of it's internal governance that we can work between offices in the local authority 
uh, and CCG who administer and make sure that we're doing things in a proper way uh, around the ICTB. Um, I know Simon um, has been pushing forward with the Warrington Together programme team and, and um, it contributes well to the ICTB so we can sort of pull, pull that together. Uh, obviously, we're starting up the sustainability group as well, so I, I don't see any problem with um, shifting perhaps the because we report sorted directly to Health and Wellbeing Board. We could just take that through a pass in the ICTB to make sure that we're connecting the programme properly, and then that's all all but done. I suppose then the question uh, for provider colleagues is, and I've put some suggestions there. You have a, a different set of problems in terms of um, your population, if you like extends beyond the boundaries of Warrington and, and you've got commitments in other areas as well. So it was the question about how do we help manage that asymmetry in the Warrington Together plan and the responsibilities of the providers better so that we're not necessarily asking you to do things that you can't deliver because of the looking um, and, and that, that, that was the end of it. And then just a personal note at the end, I think that everybody's really pulled together through COVID and it's been uh, an amazing thing to see happen and ultimately Covid's revealed the strength that we had we just didn't perhaps know that it was uh, as, as prominent as it is. There we go and that was it uh, Chair. Okay Andy thank you very much and thank you very much for your really hard work and endeavour around uh, uh, this, work, this work in the report. Are there any comments then please or questions to Andy? It's an, an observation from me, if I may. Um, uh, and I was on the um, AGM of the CCG uh, meeting this morning, uh, just thinking that um, there's, there's going to be a lot of sort of flux with CCGs and, and uh, a vision of them being much larger organisations working over this much larger um, sub-regional footprint. And I think that makes um, some of the content of this paper just far more pertinent really because uh, the challenge is going to be very much on how we distill out of all of that change and, and big picture what makes sense for Warrington uh, and I think having the agenda of these organisations and the, um, the capacity of the people um, brought together more should, should enable some of that <laughs> swifter um, more solution focused working to to carry on. So um, so I, I, I can really sort of see the uh, the benefits of that. And I think one thing that we've struggled and, and you know, when I used to chair the um, Health Scrutiny Board uh, the, um, committee, what, one of the problems was always um, about trying to get some democratic input on that. And, and it's sort of woven into here from the start. So that's certainly something that I would welcome having the opportunity to contribute to as, as we go forward. And do you wish to respond please? Um, yeah, I, I, absolutely. So I think with the um, with the context of the streamlining of CCGs, that's going to be the national drive and that's coming down from region as one CCG for Cheshire and Mersey by 2022 with joint decision making facilities from April next year. I think at the strength that we will bring to the table is if we've got a, a strong Warrington offer around the ICTB, that becomes our place-based uh, decision-making body and it becomes very difficult to disrupt um, those kind of bodies um, with, with whilst other things reorganise and the important decisions that need to be made about service offers, health and wellbeing, the prevention agenda that Maureen was uh, mentioning will all be under the auspices of that group with, with their delegation to do it. And currently we're delegating between a local CCG and the local authority. There is no difference really if we can get the scope of work correctly. If that CCG isn't as local, we'll still have local officers and representatives that are required for place. We'll be able to contribute to the activities of that board and we'll create a Warrington focused integrated commissioning offer um, that may have its um, government structures further away or more centralised but actually that won't impact on the, the work and actually might give more freedoms in some ways because there's a, uh, a need to sort of delegate that focus to the places rather than try and pull long things and get, get things done. Okay I'll just come back on that in a second. Anybody else uh, then please? 
So if I could just ask Andy if um, uh, the situation when it's more um, uh, firm about the overall organisational structures moving forward with CGGs in the future, whether or not we could discuss that in the Health and Wellbeing Board. I'm particularly interested in what you just said and also the issue of resources. If it's to be put on a footprint covering the whole of Cheshire and Merseyside, is there any danger of our current resource moving away from wine, pointing into other areas? So do you think we could perhaps discuss that at the next meeting of the Health and Wellbeing Board, if we're able to, Andy? What do you say? Yeah, I, I think I'm, I'm quite happy to have a, an ongoing dialogue about that because there's, there's, there's some bold statements made, but there, there's not a, a plan behind that yet. Because right. um, it's a, almost a trajectory. Um, so that will become clear. Happy to sort of just carry on the dialogue about it. Okay. And see, see what we get to. Thanks, Andy. Cheers. Anyone else, please? Um, just Paul Wolfson again, Steve. Um, you say this trajectory is ongoing, but did you say that it's going to be introduced from April 2021, the new um, Cheshire Mersey CCG? Uh, no, no. So um, from April 2021, we've got something called a collaborative commissioning forum, which we've had up and running for a while. Um, and that's been dealing with things like some of the specialist services, trying to make collective decisions. So there's, a, there's an ask that we start to formalise some of that because we've done it. What we've had to do is almost work things up once and then decide them nine times. Um, but actually the decision hasn't really been any different because they were they were well worked up and well engaged with each place anyway. So um, the, the ask is by April 2021 to put a bit of formality around that collaborative commissioning forum that we've got um, so that we can get things done more efficiently basically. Um, the, the ask about the single CCG is that they want to have one by 2022, which is April 2022. So um, that, that's a while off. And that, that was precipitated by the North Mersey CCGs getting to the point where they were applying for um, a North Mersey merger. But the feedback was that that wasn't an acceptable footprint and the, these trajectories were outlined in a response that I think has been shared across uh, some of the groups, um, but hence the conversation today. And you don't think that the work that's been done um, with Warrington together um, and the um, the place, um, do you don't think that that uh, those developments are going to impact negatively on the um, the place of Warrington? So I, I think our um, our challenge is firming up the place offers, as we sort of alluded to in the paper, around building that uh, semi-autonomous structure, if you like, that can survive those changes. Um, I think if there's any place that's not got a workable local solution, that's when they're vulnerable, um, because then it would have to be done um, as part of the uh, any scaling up of CCGs. If we've got something that works, then there doesn't, there's no logical reason why that, that should be unpicked as part of that uh, process. It doesn't guarantee anything because obviously the process and, and what that looks like hasn't been discussed or determined, but uh, I think it certainly puts us in a strong position if we can get that working locally. Okay, watch this space. Yeah. Logic, logic um, is something that isn't always um, <laughs> <laughs> at the fore um, at the moment, but um, I'll take the word of it. Thanks very much, Andy. And thanks, Steve. Okay, thanks, uh, Paul. Are there the comments then, please? So we'll just note the report and the principles in it, Andy, and uh, hopefully we'll see a finished item which can be circulated electronically. Otherwise, you can perhaps bring the final version back in November. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. there's a, a long way to go on it yet, but uh, I'll yeah. carry on uh, working it with Kath and colleagues and we'll get it, we'll get it hammered through. Yeah. OK, um, in which case, if we try and move back to item six, I'll hand the chair now to Rebecca, if you don't mind. So back to item six, which is around uh, the Living Well presentation. I don't know whether Anne-Marie can rejoin us now. Hello, can you hear Hello. me? Hello. Hello. So, yes, right. We're just getting your uh, up on the screen now. Oh, so I'll hand the chair over to Rebecca Knowles now. So. Uh, I'll see you all on the 12th of November, if not before. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Stephen. <clears throat> uh, 
Okay, so there's a bit of delay. There's a bit of delay on the video, so I will begin. So I'm here today to give a summary of the Health and Wellbeing um, Strategy Living Well Thematic Report. Um, so I am the Senior Health Improvement Specialist for the Public Health Team, and I oversee um, much of the prevention work um, for the team. Um, so we start off with looking at embedding prevention at all levels, and I'll refer again to the work we've done um, across the system with the Design Council project. Um, and it was very much highlighted where we need to spend a lot more time at the initiation of any new programmes of work. This is to ensure that we are, have a common purpose and we also can agree what success looks like. In the past, we've, um, we've made assumptions that when we use certain terms such as prevention, that we're referring to the same things. And from the discussions that we've had, it was really clear that we weren't talking about the same things. So a lot more time at the beginning of a, of a programme would save us a lot of time at the end of the programme to make sure that we all feel like um, each partner is successful within that. Um, that work was focused on healthy ageing, but within that we made um, a, a lot of a commitment towards looking at people in their middle years, to introducing new interventions for people aged 35 to 55 to ensure that their, their long-term health outcomes are going to be improved and that would help manage demand in the future. So that is something we'll talk about more um, in the coming months with you. Um, the Make Every Contact Count programme um, is that's the programme where we train and upskill a number of frontline staff, both professionals and, and people in the third sector, to have conversations around self-care and prevention. Um, this has obviously had to be updated post-COVID, so we're giving people new skills. Some of those new skills are around balancing the health protection of the new world, so people understanding about the increased hygiene and the social distancing, but making sure that's balanced with people ensuring that they're looking after their own health and well-being. So if you're shielding in making sure you're getting enough physical activity, people understanding how to look after their own mental health, um, and if people are working at home, again, there's a risk of people becoming socially isolated. So it's quite a different conversation we're now having to have with people. Um, alongside that as well is helping people navigate the new world. So for example, if you're going to see your GP now, you're likely to have a very different appointment than you have done traditionally. It's going to take quite a few quite a few months for people to understand these changes in healthcare and the way healthcare is going to be delivered to them. But it's for us to make people feel comfortable and get used to it and feel confident most of all within that new way of delivering to them. Um, if we then move on to uh, reducing risk factors, um, obviously COVID-19 is a disease that attacks the respiratory system. So helping people who smoke has been a big focus for us over the last few months. Um, we do have a Tobacco Control Alliance and a local plan. Um, and part of this is to really help anybody who smokes um, to quit. So we've had a lot of uh, new self-referrals over the last few months. But because of the attention of our, uh, our health colleagues has been taken away to deal with the crisis of COVID, we've had a, um, a decrease in referrals from our health colleagues. So that's something we really need to focus on in the, uh, the, the coming months. In terms of um, protecting people from secondhand smoke, uh, we've had opportunities to introduce more smoke-free outside areas, outside restaurants and bars. So. Um, this has been a, a national initiative that when people are asking for pavement licences to increase their, their seats outside, that smoke-free um, smoke free laws are part of that. So that's really helped us introduce, again, protect the majority of the population who are non-smokers from the very few people who do continue to smoke. I do also want to mention that we've done some really good work with hospital over the last few months, introducing new smoke-free processes there. Um, so we're going to continue to work with them again over the next 12 months um, and really make sure that anybody who goes into hospital is going to be who smokes will be offered support to, uh, to stop smoking. Um, in terms of the flu vaccination, the local plan has been developed. This year, um, the national um, the national drive is to add two more cohorts of people. And that's year seven children who will be vaccinated in school. And it's also adults aged 50 to 64 years old. Um, the health protection lady who is in charge of this has asked me to uh, make it clear that that is um, vaccine dependent. We're not sure if there's enough vaccine to vaccinate everybody between the ages of 50 to 64. So we need to be clear that those most at risk, those who have got um, underlying diseases, um, long-term conditions, 
um, such as asthma, people who are very overweight, they should be the ones who are encouraged to get that vaccine first. They've also increased that target for all groups to be 75% coverage. Okay, the next slide, please. Um, so in terms of how we're supporting mental health, um, there has been a big focus on middle-aged men because um, that's where we found the uh, evidence shows there is the most risk. Today is actually World Suicide Prevention Day. So there are a number of activities going on across the town. There's a nighttime walk this evening um, and there's a film introducing, um, introducing the issues and introducing ways that we can care for our family, our friends and our co-workers that's going to be held in the town centre as well. Um, as well as the extra support for people who may be suffering from um, um, poor mental health or, or low emotional well-being, there's also a number of um, projects that we're running which help both professionals and people in the community to have different, more supportive conversations with people who may have low mood. So there is a number of training, um, training courses that, that can last anywhere between just 10 minutes to half an hour. So those 10 minute courses, people should leave then and have more of an idea how to introduce the subject and how to have a much more productive conversation with somebody who may be feeling low. It's interesting that they've now introduced um, feelings of social isolation following the lockdown period. So a lot of people who may be single and live on their own, and they may not have to be part of a, a higher risk group than that, but have suffered enormously over the last few months. And it's just an acknowledgement of, of that, really. Um, if we then move on to self-care, um, we're working um, across the system, as it's been acknowledged in some of the other reports today, around prevention. Um, there's a real focus on us. Um, really expanding the, the thoughts around self-care and personalised care. So we're talking to people about what would make their whole, uh, their whole life, their health and well-being better for them, rather than us telling them what's wrong with them, how we're going to cure it, and offering a more holistic approach to that. So the wellbeing service um, has been in place for a number of years now. It's had an evaluation, and it's shown where it did have a, a positive return on the investment. And that was based on that personalised care and self-care model where there's a well-being star and we look at all different aspects of their life. So it will be carrying on working with different parts of the system to make sure that that's strengthened. Um, I'm also working um, with primary care networks at the moment, um, both to ensure that that social prescribing roles are embedded within the current system, that they enhance um, what we've already got and, and work in synergy with what we've already got. And we're also trialling a new lifestyle, lifestyle support um, project so people who are on their CVD registered and have um, just been maybe diagnosed with um, high blood pressure or with heart disease, that as part of their care package, they're going to get some lifestyle support alongside the clinical care that they received at the same time. And then finally, um, it is an update from the CPG. So I don't know, Carl, if you want to come in at this point and talk about the work you've been doing over the last 12 months. All, all, all I wanted to do, uh, I think we've covered the, the main thing there, is just to, uh, to to do my usual thing, my usual confession around how disingenuous I feel when my name is on there, because the hard yards are done by others. And if you look at the report, you can see that that is a large cast. And I was involved in the design council work. I've always tried to make prevention front and centre of the work we do. I think it's a real determined effort now across the system and so when we look at those areas where we have opportunities to improve outcomes for the people of Warrington they are complex pathways and they are across lots of different services and providers so we have that real genuine desire to make sure that any redesign and transformation is from prevention to end of life at all points within that and I just wanted to uh, to echo that and, and that real emphasis on promotion, prevention, and that holistic approach. So not separating out mental and physical health, making sure that we are talking about my mum and not services. That, that's all I wanted to add. And yeah, the team that pulled these together. Okay, thank you for that. That's the end of the report from me. Thank you very much, Anne-Marie. Um, any comments, questions? 
Sorry, did you get that? Did my did I go off mute? I was just saying thank you to Anne Marie and uh, inviting any comments or questions. Uh, Rebecca, it's Steve Cullen from Citizens Advice. Thanks, Steve. Uh, yeah, thanks, Anne Marie. Re really welcome the report and some of the um, some of the actions that are going on in there. But it, it does strike me that it, it's a little bit light or very light on some of the um, you know, entrenched problems that we're having Warrington, child poverty, poverty in working families, massive over indebtedness, some of our housing and homelessness problems, all, all of these things that affect um, you know, people's um, health and well-being as much as some of the other things that are mentioned in the report. Yes, and, and, and I do agree. And um, so um, I think the work that we have started via the um, the, the welfare reform action group we need to take forward but we've also had that enormous opportunity with the central six master plan and i think the central Ma central six master plan delivery board is gives us an opportunity to really then um, tackle some of those uh, wider determinants of health so exactly the child poverty issues over the summer we knew they existed particularly the holiday hunger um, agenda we knew they've existed in previous years and because of the crisis fighting because of COVID, what we delivered this year was actually smaller than was delivered in previous years rather than bigger. So that is something I am taking through to the master plan delivery board. Um, but you're right, it should have been mentioned within this report as well. And I'll ensure in the future that we join those two different agendas to up. Yeah, thanks, I'm really appreciate that. Okay. I think it's it's certainly true to say that uh, the more work there is on uh, prevention, the more it happens sort of further upstream and, and the less the solutions are medical ones. Um, and, and that's where the, um, the value of the whole system working together, in, including the third sector part of it, um, really will come into play. And, and I think that really neatly ties up with uh, with what Tara was saying in her report about being aware of the the economic situation and, and the fact that that underpins um, the, the, the health and well-being of people in, in, in the widest sense. Um, any more any more questions or comments on this? Just a little Rebecca. comment. Oh. Go on, Andy. Yes, yeah. Jeff. Sorry, Maureen. Um, thank you for that. And um, it was just to sort of build on what you were saying there, Rebecca. I think you're absolutely right. And it's a big tanker to turn, isn't it? They, use of healthcare resources because of the treatment of diseases and disabilities and other things that arise because of um, or as a consequence of people's upbringing environment and uh, other processes to then shifting the focus to how do we create a healthier environment and uh, do the prevention work upstream i think we're really starting to turn that around in the thinking and the work that we're doing and ultimately we have to do that anyway because if we carry on with the growth in, in those uh, more medical models of care, there won't be enough people to provide it. Uh, so we, we do need to really double down on that focus over the next few years uh, and shift uh, shift our approach to that holistic uh, environmental and, and community-based approach to, to give us sustainable services going forward. It's it's so about so much more than demand management, really. It's about quality of life, isn't it? Maureen, do you want to oh, come in now? Yes, thank you, Rebecca. Um, just really to um, re-emphasise what I was saying earlier about prevention, uh, and and I think we all accept here that prevention isn't a luxury; it's a necessity. And I, I guess I've been in quite a privileged position. Um, to be able to look at um, some of the work going on through a very close lens, for example, the work on tobacco uh, and re reducing smoking and the work on suicide prevention. And when we look at that and the amount of work that we can do um, as, as health partners to reduce uh, uh, use of sm uh, smoking and to reduce um, suicide, it really does make a difference. And I think that's the key thing that the prevention isn't isn't a kind of frill that we add on to make us look as if we're doing something. It really does make a difference. Um, I do also just want to thank Steve for his comments on poverty. I know we work quite closely together um, addressing issues of poverty, but I think yes, if we can, you know, have that as a, noted in the report as well. Um, and certainly the child poverty obviously comes into starting well rather than living well, but it, it, it's, uh, you know, there's, there's plenty of poverty still in the town and it's certainly my concern 
as to what that's going to look like, you know, in another six months time, because we don't know how the economy is going to go. Um, but yes, the message today for me is prevention, 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 uh, and making sure that we have the tools and the funding to do that well. Yeah. Uh, can I come in, Rebecca? Paul Warburton. Um, I, I agree what, with what's been said, and I think it, the, the document's really good. I think the focus on um, well-being and ill health is, is really, really important, as has been said. Um, I, I also uh, welcome the, the primary care networks um, to embed the social prescribing, because there is funding available for social prescribers. Um, is, there, is there actually any work going on to appoint those within the primary care networks? Um, maybe it's a question for Andy. Uh, yes, there is. Um, the networks are working with our primary care commissioners and I think there might even be some people already in post, but I don't want to make that promise if it's not true. So we can provide you a brief note on where that's up to, but definitely things are, are moving in a positive direction on that one. Great. Thanks very much, Annie. Any more questions or comments, observations on, on this item? OK, thanks. In that case, everyone, um, I think our next item is item eight, which is the Public Accounts Committee um, readying the NHS and social care for the COVID-19 peak. Now, this this just feels um, rather out of date now, doesn't it, uh, in terms of where we've got up to because it's such a rapidly moving situation. Um, I'm just wondering how. How we uh, want to to handle this one. Um, perhaps if we sort of start with Simon with a few opening remarks and then uh, and then people can pitch in. Is that all right, Simon? Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm grateful for that steer. Yes, it is out of date, but I think um, Stephen wanted it on for two reasons, really. Firstly, there is, if I um, limit my commentary to the summary, there is um, formal recognition that health and social care are two sides of the same coin and that they deserve a parity of esteem and investment. Um, and secondly, really, um, given that we're beholden to national policy, which seems to be glacial in terms of its pro progress, um, is there anything locally we can do, uh, action and consider, uh, perhaps a recalibration of joint budgets to preventative and social care interventions, uh, but also, um, people be aware of some of the commentary of the national press around whether the cost of an integrated health and social care system is not just the reorganisation of NHS bodies, but potentially also the reorganisation of local government. Um, so those are the two issues I wanted to talk about, a recognition, formal recognition, but also is there anything locally that we can be on the front foot with in relation to the emerging policy landscape? I hope that's helpful. I, th I think it is, and uh, in 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 many ways, um, that sort of fits in with with a lot of the uh, the other items that we're already talking about in terms of prevention and how stuff fits together. Um, anybody want to sort of pitch in with a comment on on that to follow? Hi, Rebecca. It's Andy. Thanks, Andy. So I think um, it was a. I, I read it and it's a good document. I, I like it when documents are honest and uh, I don't think there were any uh, punches pulled on either side in that in, in that one. And um, it did highlight sort of things that you sort of recognise in systems that the, the, the way that things are divided at the moment is artificial. Um, and the, uh, the way that we approach funding different parts of the system is inequitable. Um, so there are things that I think we could do locally and it links back to some of the stuff that we were talking about in the uh, how do we reset Warrington together as an initiative and how do we build confidence uh, in in that that arrangement of just putting our funds together to deliver on the whole spectrum of uh, initiatives that we need to do to promote health well-being uh, and manage those people who are unfortunate enough not to be able to avoid disease or, or disability for the vast array of reasons that, that happen so we've got uh, I think we've got a good opportunity in Warrington because we have got those mechanisms to be able to provide assurance to both uh, bodies, the local authority and council um, and the um, NHS. 
um, because that's the trick. The NHS, providing the insurance to the NHS keeps us uh, within, uh, it keeps us able to expend public monies for the purposes of healthcare. And that's always been the tricky bit to, to get right. And I think we're, we're almost there with what we're doing in Warrington and, and I had hoped that we could address a lot of the issues that that report uh, highlights for us. We've, we've certainly got some evidence locally of um, uh, bits where that sort of joined up thinking is um, really starting to pay dividends, haven't we? Um, and obviously the way the better the way the better care fund uh, works and, and the the joint approach to that. That's that's one example. And, and uh, certainly um, the work around things like integrated discharge and, and the way that works. Um, between the different sectors um, ha has paid some dividends and it, and it feels to me as though that has helped with the resilience of our hospital and our, our response to the sort of acute phase of of coronavirus that we've had so far in, in terms of the uh, demand on the hospital. Uh, I, I don't know if anybody wants to pitch in on, on that aspect. Rebecca, it's Ian. Thanks, Ian. If, if I can, yes. I mean, it's a more general point. I mean, yes, I thought this was a very interesting report. I mean, I feel very strongly that here in Warrington, we have done an excellent job in working the, the council and the NHS working together in all sorts of ways, which we've talked about today and in previous occasions. It does concern me a lot that the, I mean, this is a highly political point, but it's a political issue, this, we can't escape from it. I, I'm concerned that the government might see it a rather different way and be trying to sort of take away social care from local authorities and combine it in some sort of central organisation. Um, OK, good, good that it be linked to the NHS, but I, the idea of this being done centrally, I think just flies in the face of all the evidence and all the sort of the good work we've done. So anything we could do to try and sort of combat that and lobby, whether it's the MPs or whatever, I don't quite know it's the role of this board, but I do feel very strongly that the, there's a severe risk because I know there's a that the Prime Minister set up a, a some sort of group working parties look seriously at this. I'm just concerned it might go all the wrong way and undo a lot of the excellent work that we have done in Warrington. I'm sure it's been done in, in other council areas as well. Thank you. I, I think Ian, um, it's it's inevitably it's a political point because there are going to be big, big political decisions on national stage made on this. But uh, I think that probably uh, links in fairly neatly to um, Kath's next item, which which is around uh, some of the pressures on social care, because that that's the sort of the, the bit of the system where we're in a policy vacuum at the moment and where there has been such uh, an awful lot of pressure on on things over these past months and where really the problems have revealed themselves uh, rather more than uh, than in the NHS, I think. But uh, I think. Rebecca, Did anybody get any? Like most of it, yes. You cut out right. at the end. Right. Can I come back with a quick thought on that one? Of course. I would just think the, the, the discussion we were talking about earlier about how do we bring together health and the social care dimensions of what we do and, and broader than that with the local authority in terms of an integrated commissioning function, it, it's probably worthwhile thinking through does, does that actually provide protection about the other side of that problem as well? Because we're, we're looking at it from a NHS and the restructuring there, but even if there were to be some form of discussion about how and where social care is done, if we've got an integrated solution locally, then surely that might be a protection there as well, as a, as a thought. That on the sort of if it ain't if it ain't broke, don't fix it kind of um, a defence mechanism. Well, if we've got and something that's working well and we can demonstrate that it's working effectively. Yeah, absolutely. And I think also that the people who who actually deliver the assessments for the individuals will all need to be locally managed and locally deliver that because it's a very personal thing, isn't it? So there has to be some form of local point of aggregation of all of that um, sort of accountability and, and uh, work so that you can you know, commit the people to the right work with the right focus. And that has to be done at place, even if there are other vagaries going on. Having a good, solid, robust, integrated function, I think, helps protect against that as well. Do you know we're in danger? Testing. 
we're in danger of a huge amount of consensus breaking out, which is an interesting and heartening thing, actually. Uh, I, I'm just wondering whether Simon wants to uh, come back at that point or whether anyone else has anything to add. Thank you, Chair. Um, no, that's been really refreshing. I think what we need to be is be on the front foot, as I said, and any local solutions make uh, any forthcoming national policy directives um, you know, redundant in relation to trying to unpick our, our local uh, arrangements. I do think there is a spectra, though, in relation to organisational turbulence and what that means in relation to the functions of local government and the possibility of regional government. Um, but that's perhaps something we need to uh, just be um, be uh, con cognizant of. I think we need to be highly aware of that and obviously horizon scanning. Uh, there are plenty of people applying their minds to that, but it's uh, it's it's it feels as though things are um, quite fluid at the moment and uh, there inevitably is going to be change. I think uh, it's about making best sense of it, isn't it? As people have said earlier on, um, if, if nobody else has anything to add on that one, um, I think we could move on to CAF. Anything to add on this or should we move on to CAF? OK, then uh, we're on to item nine, which is uh, reset, not restart from Kath Jones. Thanks. OK, thanks, Rebecca. Um, ironically, in a way, this this paper um, that that I'm going to talk through almost sums up everything that we've been saying this afternoon in terms of the importance of working together as a system and really developing a strong place and people based focused uh, to the work in in Warrington. Uh, basically, fundamentally, this this um, title reset, not restart. Um, what I wanted to just feed back to you was the outcome of a paper that was done nationally. Um, it was a survey of the uh, directors of social services um, asking what the impact of COVID had been. And really, I wanted to share that with you because I felt it was an opportunity both to highlight the contribution of adult social care, because I think that's really come into focus through COVID, but also what it's highlighted is the burning need for reform, as we've been talking about. And today really was about seeking your agreement to the principles that are embodied in the um, report um, that's come from um, Northwest, well, from National ADAS. Um, so ADAS is made up of all the former and current directors, plus all the principal social workers who are the people who are closest to practice. Um, Generally, their role is to influence uh, and shape policy uh, and also promote uh, standards within social care. And the result of the survey that, survey that they did was to come up with nine strategic statements which they really felt would shape adult social care reform going forward. And they believe, so do I, that more than ever now is the time for us to lobby both nationally and regionally about the urgency of that reform for adult social care, because this has been brewing for years. There's been a significant underfunding of social care, and I think it's really brought that to the fore in the in the last few months. We could just go to the next slide. Thank you. So in terms of the challenges that emerged from the survey, um, one of the things that came out of that from feedback from directors was about how generally a lot of the funding within adult social care is time limited and short term funding. And what that does in essence is it, it curtails your ability to plan in any sort of long term way. So I referred when I was discussing the update around ICTB that um, we have a better care fund now that funding envelope is a 12 month funding envelope, but there's millions of pounds within that that um, uh, determine the future of our particularly our intermediate tier services. So that's a lot of the community services that we that support people and keep them well and at home. Uh, but that's done on an annual basis, which doesn't support long term planning. Um, they also identified in the survey that we've got fragile care markets. 
Now, in Warrington, we have got 1,700 beds within the care market for people aged over 65, and 55% of those are usually commissioned by the council. So what we have seen as a result of COVID has been an average fall in occupancy from about 95% to 86 percent. We've actually got 250 fewer residents in our care sector than we had in January 2020. That's generally been effect, most affected in the nursing and dementia nursing areas. Um, so there's, there's um, a difference in where that impact has been felt, but indicate, early indicators are that it's going to take our care sector a good 12 to 18 months to recover and stabilise from that. Now, we've been doing significant work with the provider sector to, to support and, the, and uh, there's been 1.7 million government funding invested in terms of stabilising our care sector since March 2020. But that is going to come to an end and we need to ensure that we have a stable care sector to support people going into the future. Um, the report also referred to the increasing demographic pressures. So we know in Warrington that we're going to have 42% more people aged over 85 in the next 10 years. There's going to be more people living with frailty and there's going to be an increase of a third of people with dementia over the next 10 years. And the issue there is that that then leads to uh, increasing levels of undermet and unmet need because that's also in the climate of reducing budgets and the requirement to balance the budget, which means even as we identify more need, the challenges is uh, identifying the resources that can that can meet those needs. We also know in terms of prevention that that is, it, you know, it, investing in the early intervention and health and well-being services that Anne-Marie talked about earlier is often the key to keeping people well and connected in their communities. And it can have a massive influence in terms of both preventing delaying and reducing the need for long-term support. But actually, a lot of that work is not a short-term fix. It's not a 12-month project. It's an approach that will take five years plus to deliver. And I think we need to have be bold in terms of some of our approaches going forward to supporting the people of Warrington. The survey also talked about some of the issues around recruitment and retention of the workforce. We know locally that we've got an aging social care workforce and also we've had traditionally the issue of Warrington having a particularly stable economy um, so that wages in social care have struggled to compete. I mean, what we are finding currently is that there is good take up in terms of our vacancies, probably as a result of the um, uh, what's happened in COVID. Um, but fundamentally, these issues will impact on our ability to deliver the outcomes that we want um, for the people of Warrington, and that's to live good, healthy, happy lives as independently as possible and for as late on in life as possible. And we want to be able to offer employment opportunities and careers in social care in a thriving market. Sorry, next slide, please, if that's OK. So these were some of the um, high level figures that came out of the survey uh, nationally in terms of plan savings to social care budgets that are no longer possible. So across the sector, 7.7 .7 billion of savings have been made in adult social care over the last 10 years. And it gives you an indication of how much we've been uh, becoming as efficient and streamlining as much as possible. In the local context, we've actually delivered 9 million cashable savings since 2016 and 6 million in cost avoidance work to support the budget. So over the coming year in 2021, nationally, there was 608 million of planned savings in adult social care budgets, which, of course, as a result of COVID, that um, has, has had a significant impact in our ability to deliver on that going forward. In Warrington locally, we have a three million saving target. But what has happened is there's been a pause on any of our retendering admission, uh, any of our retendering and commissioning. There's higher cost to care packages um, to keep people at home. And also we've got reduced income. 
because, as we know, there's more let fewer people um, in the older people sector, and that's had an impact on our on our income, which is a very sad situation, but that is a genuine impact. And also in that survey, pretty shockingly, 69% of directors indicated that over 60% of the planned savings were at risk. So this really highlights the significant risk that we're in, in nationally, not just locally, in terms of being able to deliver to the aspirations that we want around social care in Warrington. This gives you some indication as well. So in the survey, the difference between 2019 and 20 to 2020 to 21 was measuring the confidence that directors felt in, in terms of being able to meet their statutory duties. And 35% of directors nationally felt that they had no confidence in their ability to meet our statutory duties, which is about safeguarding our vulnerable people and um, meeting the needs of adults with social care needs. However, on a positive, uh, in quite a challenging situation, there were national reflections on what has happened with COVID. And I think it's fair to say that the true value of adult social care has really come to the public fore. We have seen the wonderful uh, effort of many of our low paid workers in care home settings who've actually moved in to prevent infection spread. It's been really humbling to see the um, the commitment of our social care workforce, not just within the council, but in the in the wider provider sector. But we've seen that people have really struggled to, with lockdown. People have really struggled to cope without carer support. Um, our day services for younger adults with mental health and learning disability services have had to stop. And we've also really struggled to deliver respite services because of the risk of infection. And um, all of that is impacting massively on families and their ability to manage people in the community. I think it's also demonstrated the importance of the social work contribution and our role in safeguarding people. Um, because during COVID, our social work teams reorganised. We did weekly, daily calls and we identified those people who were isolated, who had complex needs, whose care packages had had to be reduced and uh, looked at innovative ways to try and support people in that situation. Uh, we know that adult social care, adult abuse is often hidden. Um, and we play a key role in adult social care to be the eyes and ears in terms of seeing what is going on in community settings. And since the end of lockdown, we've experienced a significant increase in the number of safeguarding uh, referrals as the impact of COVID emerges. So I think it's also highlighted because of all of the, that, that um, councils are the right home for adult social care. This harps back to that conversation we were having earlier about needing to make sure we still have a place-based offer and that actually locally we've shown we can react, we can respond to local need, we understand and work well with our provider sector, we've quickly set up hubs and worked together as a system, we've managed some of the issues around lack of PPE, um, we've supported our provider sector with financial support where that's been needed, and we've reprioritised home visits for equipment, all the things that have really helped to keep people safe and well at home. Uh, we've freed up hospital pathways um, and we've improved partnership working significantly across the piece with our third sector partners, with our health colleagues, with housing. We've worked well together. But I think all of this has exposed and magnified the challenges that we have faced for more than a decade. There's increased demand and expectations, a shrinking budget, and we have real capacity issues across the system in terms of how we're going to meet need going forward. Sorry, next slide. So I think we touched on this as well in the previous paper, 
Nationally, we know that in the early months of COVID, the balance was wrong in terms of trying to protect the NHS and discharging patients into care homes. Um, we're now aware much more regionally, this was what Simon was, Simon Kenton was touching on about new plans emerging for more regional systems, having a, a regional a partnership board to serve communities and streamlining the commissioning uh, of CCGs, typically within one CCG uh, system uh, across the system. But we know that um, as a system is moving towards this larger footprint, I think there's a real danger that we lose, say, lose sight of our place-based initiatives and the abil our ability to work responsibly in communities with the knowledge of local need and the resources that we've got locally. I think we need to build on the progress that we've made as a local system during COVID. Now's not the time to lose what we've developed. And in, 30, in my 30 years of working across health and social care, I can honestly say that to genuinely deliver transformation, we need to be brave, we need to do the right things. And we have developed um, trust and confidence across senior leaders locally. And having come this far, it's really important we don't throw the bathwater out with the baby. Bit of an old fashioned saying, but it's uh, it's accurate. If we could just move on to the next one. So I do think we have found a new normal and this shows up in the arrangements that we've now got in place around rapid discharge, joint decision making through ICTB, more integrated working on the front line. We've really joined up our decision making. And we need to reset the relationship with the NHS with a new emphasis on community care, on prevention and early intervention and social care really needs a long term plan. Sorry, if we can just move on. I think this slide, this is from the survey. And again, this is illuminating in that directors were asked about how they felt nationally about whether there was sufficient primary and community services. Um, so you can see there that 40% of directors felt there were insufficient mental health services. 30% felt there was ins insufficient services around substance misuse, 17% um, reablement and rehab, and 15% discharge to assess. That's about the pathways out of hospital and trying to get people home as much as possible. Um, so it's highlighted um, that that isn't just, you know, that isn't a local system, that's a national system. And it's, it's so what do we do about that now? Where do we go knowing that that's the feedback that we're getting nationally? Sorry, if we could move on. So on the basis of that survey, ADAS nationally made some recommendations and came up with a set of principles about how to shape a better future. We could just move on, sorry. So these are the nine recommendations and principles that they made about the first one of those. And that's why I've sort of brought it to this arena. It's about needing a public conversation about adult social care reform. I don't I think we need to be shouting about it from the rooftops in every way that we can around the gap in funding, the need to keep our services local. Um, and uh, that we we're not going to be able to continue to meet our statutory requirements if something isn't done significantly to change where we're at now. Um, we need to, to build on the developments that we've made around integrated care and there's been significant developments. Um, building care around the individual in their communities should absolutely become the norm and we need to have a complete review of how care markets operate. Um, for example, I think a lot of people will be aware of the inequity in um, how the care home, how care, how the care services operate at the moment. There is an inequity with choice and um, very often dependent on the level of savings that people have, often subsidising local authority placements due to inadequate government funding, basically. So we must address some of the existing and historical inequalities that we have. 
we just go to the next slide. Sorry, I'm trying to speed up. <laughs> um, Further recommendations that are being made nationally by ADAS, we need good quality housing and accommodation. It's absolutely central to care and to our lives. And we see that um, frequently in adult social care in Warrington. We need houses that, that are adapted, where there's access, uh, where we can accommodate families with, for children with disabilities. And that needs to be a, a golden thread through our service delivery. We need a strategy for a social care workforce for carers that incorporates both formal and informal care carers. And we, we really need to build on the work that's been done around technology and digital solutions. Um, we have a care call service, we have telecare, we have telehealth, all of which are designed to help people manage with their long term conditions at home and for longer. Fundamentally, we need a cross government strategy and what we need is um, a mechanism, a managed and funded transition pending proper long term funding for adult social care. So how can we make this a reality? I think it, a lot of this is about the fact that we have really what's happened has raised public awareness. It's never been as high around the contribution of adult social care. ADAS nationally are developing a new vision and a 10 year timetable time for change. Um, I think it's important that we aren't short termism in our thinking in Warrington, because, as I said, a lot of the work that we're doing requires long term thinking and long term investment. But I think we need to utilise the influence of, of councillors, of MPs in terms of lobbying government on this agenda around long term reform of adult social care. And we must be joined up in our messaging to government, acknowledging the role of adult social care and the need for reform. So I would just ask you finally, um, really, this was about sharing with you the findings from that national survey, but also asking for your support and voice to this reform agenda um, nationally. That's that's it. <laughs> Thank you very much, Kath. There's an awful lot of food for thought in there, but also a lot that really echoes with uh, other items uh, on the agenda here. And uh, I'm just wondering who who uh, feels as though they have a comment or or an observation or a question for you. I'd like to say something just very briefly. Oh, can you Go hear ahead. me? Can you hear me? Yeah, we can. OK, um, yes, no, thank you, Kath. It's a, a really helpful report and fully supportive of the recommendations there. Um, I suppose um, the inequity is something you drew attention to, and it's not just the um, economic inequity of individuals, but there's also the inequity of of different areas of the country and the resources that different councils have. And, and I think that that's become worse. Um, with the cap on funding to councils and, and how councils have managed to increase their funding, but at varying rates, um, depending on how how well they're, they're funded in the first place. Um, I'm thinking of Surrey Springs to mind as having lots of um, houses that have a large council tax and being able to keep it uh, in terms of the, the size of the houses and being able to keep increasing that by 2% looks very different to what we can do in Warrington. Um, but the other point I wanted to make um, was that I think, yes, the attention has really focused on adult social care um, during COVID, um, but the attention has really been on older people. And I know a lot of the work you do is also for people of working age who who do require um, adult social care because of their disabilities, sometimes profound disabilities. And I know that it, with, in housing, we've worked very closely with adult social care to get some really good solutions for those people, but they are expensive, um, expensive solutions. And, and even when they are expensive, the, the solutions we've come up with have managed to save us some money as well. So um, that those individuals shouldn't be forgotten, I suppose, um, that part of our work is for for the um, older and retired population, but that's only one part of what we do and, and we need to maintain a focus on the other part of what we do as we move forward. If that makes sense. Yes, absolutely. 
uh, thank you, Councillor McLaughlin. We've um, we've been working significantly this year on um, housing, uh, the part of our housing strategy, if you like, that supports people um, with complex needs who are of working age and looking at how we can um, acquire and adapt properties uh, to meet need in that area. There's been a specific capital programme this year around that. And it, again, that's around being ambitious about local solutions, isn't it? Uh, the solutions that are the right ones for people, but also the ones that are the most cost effective, given the huge demand that um, that adult social care places on, on the council's budget. It's such a, a large uh, proportion of the of the council's budget. I, I guess for somewhere like Warrington, where we do have a strong local economy, one of the ironies is um, to do with our uh, the amount of business rates that we uh, generate, but that we can't uh, keep to spend on on local people. But again, I, I think I'm in danger of uh, straying into politics with that one. Um, has anybody else got any comments uh, to add to this? Very very useful report and uh, something that probably. Um, resonates with the general public in a way that it didn't a few months ago. I think people have started to realise it's everyone's business. And, and I think we've also done some good, we're talking about comms earlier, did some good awareness work earlier on about the number of people needing care and, and you know the location of our care homes across the borough, because obviously this is, um, this is an issue for... Oh. Every corner of the borough and uh, and also lots of people, isn't it? Rebecca, I think we're just losing you a bit. Yeah. Any? Could I, I, I dropped out part way through the conversation, so I apologise if this has already been said, but um, I, I welcome the, the report and, and the recommendations. But um, I think the clap for carers thing, um, which um, was um, a bit of a mixed bag really in lots of ways, but I think it, it did actually show to lots of the population what we class as um, low wage and, and low skilled um, uh, careers. and, and I think most people, or lots of people, have now realised that low wages don't actually mean low skill, um, and a lot of these um, caring roles are actually very, very high value and very high skilled. Uh, and I think having a strategy for um, the social care workforce is a really positive thing. And I think the the town deal actually begins to address some of this. And I, I think uh, I, I welcome that, and I also welcome the report. So thanks very much for sharing, Kath. It was very good. I've lost you again. I think we've lost our chair. Is yeah. Jenny still there? Is Jenny still there? Did you Is catch my... For... Oh, I caught you, Paul. Is it possible for Rebecca to phone in? Or is that going to take forever? Was this this was the last item on the agenda, wasn't it? Was there one more? Have I missed? Oh, it no, was the yeah, NHS no, one on one sorry, first. Sorry. The yeah. early yeah. comments yeah. society is there as well. Well, can I propose that um, we, we hope that Rebecca comes back, but maybe we could move on to that. Comments. Would that be a bit cheeky of me? <laughs> in in that back. case, I have to say the um, sound keeps dropping in and out from lots of lots of people. It's Simon Constable um, here. Yes, I think there are some issues with the technology. I I just got dropped out, and everything else was fine. Are we better deferring NHS one 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 if we're having difficulty with the sound? Um, I don't know what Simon would say there. It's just whether everyone well, can hear. All, all I will say is that it, it's. Um, rather contemporaneous because we went live in Warrington this week. So yeah, I think it's important that it's discussed. Yeah. 
Yeah, I can hear. Um, it's just Sorry. Rebecca that I've lost. So, okay. Shall go I, ahead, Simon. Shall I, shall I go ahead? Yes, yeah. Please. OK, thank you, everybody. So I'll, I'll be very cognizant that probably just to open it up to questions, but there is a briefing uh, report in the in the in the pack uh, and, I'll, and I'm very happy to take questions in a moment. I'll just I think we must. Hello, can we? Uh, Go ahead. I'll, yeah. I'll, yeah. I'll provide a, an, a, an overview. Uh, I'm, I'm clearly pleased that we were <coughs> able to uh, be one of the first um, uh, sites in the patch uh, in, in the northwest to do this um, in terms of the expansion of the NHS 111 system, uh, attempting to bring some predictability to uh, urgent and emergency care. Um, uh, and it would have been important at any time, I think, in terms of an expansion and, and the ability to do such things such as booked appointments into the emergency department and assessment centres, but it becomes even more uh, relevant in a COVID-19 area for infection prevention and control reasons. Um, we've gone live uh, this week in um, Warrington. So uh, Warrington uh, and Holton and our local health economy is one of two first mover sites in the northwest as part of a national rollout program. Blackpool went live a couple of weeks ago and we went live uh, at 10 a.m. on uh, Tuesday. Um, it's very much a gentle introduction of, of this, uh, uh, being, being regarded as a, a soft launch before a large national rollout, clearly as part of a pilot programme. Um, and and uh, one of the big things that, uh, the big changes really is, is so much as the ability to have timed appointments in urgent care settings, including the emergency department, uh, as well as uh, alternative routes into systems for assessment, which can be very varied according to local health economies. Uh, and I think that's something that's going to be expanded upon in, in coming weeks and months. Um, you don't have to have everything ready before you start, uh, but NHS 111 capacity in terms of call handling and uh, clinical assessment capacity uh, is clearly important under those circumstances, as well as having a disposition uh, uh, in, in terms of urgent and emergency care uh, locally. Um, as, as I said, very important from a, from a point of view of the COVID-19 uh, era, because what we want to avoid uh, is crowding in emergency departments for all sorts of reasons. And often the emergency department is often a waiting uh, area for other assessment services uh, that we need to try and avoid. Uh, so this has been very much a whole system approach, including uh, you know all partners in the local health economy, and I think it's, it's been done at breakneck speed. Bearing in mind, it was only a couple of months ago that we were selected to be a pilot site, um, and I can report today, uh, based on the first 48 hours of the service, very obviously early days. We've had 26 patients. Uh, through booked appointments in the emergency department, uh, which is, you know, a drop in the ocean potentially, uh, but is, is a good uh, a, a basis on which to start. Um, the communication, obviously, at the moment, very, very gentle, just a gentle awareness and some uh, local local media and a, a soft launch, uh, but there's going to be a national uh, communications uh, package uh, 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 ahead of the deeper part of winter, I think, starting from December. Um, uh, and um, uh, clearly that's given with a, with a rollout to other uh, other organisations, other trusts across the country, including those in the northwest, including our neighbouring organisations. Um, that's all I was going to say. Uh, I'm very happy to take questions. I think there would be just one further point I would want to make is that although we're encouraging patients to use NHS 111, um, uh, and, uh, uh, and we'll be publicising that no patient will ever be turned away from the emergency department if, and they, if they haven't done so. Our job will be to make sure that they get into the right place at the right time and get the right assessment. Uh, and clearly that will uh, change uh, as we uh, are able to expand our offering across the whole health economy. Happy to take questions. OK, I'll have a go. Am I back? Can people hear me? Yeah. Yes, great, brilliant. Um, yes, uh, I had a, had a child come home and go on the internet, so I'm very sorry. <laughs> You'll have to wait. Um, I think that's that's very useful, Simon. I'm sorry um, that you've had to wait so long to present that this afternoon, but I think it's probably one that we'll need to come back 
um, when you're a bit further into it to to let us know how things are going. I don't know what sort Indeed. of time scale. Indeed, well, look, I, I'm very happy to bring uh, an update report back uh, at the next Health and Wellbeing Board if that's what's required. I, I think that will be very useful. Now, whether it comes back to the next one or you want to leave it a bit longer to have a proper chance to see how, how it's uh, bedding in. Um, it's perhaps a matter to discuss with with uh, Stephen in terms of agenda setting, but uh, um, I think it, it's indicative, isn't it, of the fact that Warrington's do, getting a lot of things right, that it gets these pilots. We've we've had a few across the system, uh, and I think it's much to be welcomed. So long as they don't sort of divert energy in wrong directions, it's really good to be able to try things out and see what works for us, make it our own, isn't it? Indeed, I'm very pleased to be selected. I think it's good to be influencing these things at the start. Uh, and um, I, we've had some very good feedback from the national team in terms of how we've conducted ourselves as a local health economy. So I'm, I'm, I'm really pleased with that. that that's uh, really, really good to hear. And uh, I'm just wondering if anyone has any comments yeah. or observations on it. Simon, cool. Robson, I've got a question for you. Um, I think it's a really fantastic um, uh, introduction of something which is going to hopefully um, get people to the right care at the right time um, and I think it will, has the potential to move a lot of people away from A&E that don't actually need to be there. So of the 26 patients that you've had that have come through, what, what has the response um, been like and what has the clinical need of those patients been? And do you know if um, there have been many people that have been diverted away from A&E that would have otherwise attended? Uh, so, it, so it, in, in the two parts of that question, I can't answer the detail in terms of the, 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 the disposition. Uh, in terms of those patients, they've all been uh, seen in uh, the emergency department per se, but in, in booked appointments. So it's really early days, as I said, to, to, to give any more sort of qualitative or quantitative feedback as to uh, the disposition. We've got a, a, a situation report that's been fed back, uh, and probably next time I'll be able to give you some more firm data. Um, very happy to share that sooner um, as to uh, how things are uh, going. The, the, the aim will be to do a, mix, a, a mixed, um, rather mixed economy of, of seeing patients in our emergency department that would come in anyway, but in booked slots to smooth out the ebbs and flows, the peaks and troughs that, that cause us quite significant difficulties, but also um, uh, divert patients into the other more appropriate um, settings for their particular pathway. That may include hot clinics in our own organisation, um, for instance, other assessment areas within the trust. It may include uh, primary care and that will uh, 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 and other assessment services. Um, but uh, I can't provide any details thus far on what's happened with the 26 that have already come through. OK, and the communications campaign, um, how is that going to be managed uh, locally? So that is so it's a national campaign with with but with a, a lo local adaptation for, for uh, a national camp uh, for uh, uh, you know the, the the rollout. I don't think anybody uh, is on the call at the moment that can provide any of the detail as to how we're planning to do this uh, locally. It's being uh, uh, jointly run between ourselves and 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 uh, the, the CCG. Um, but it, it's a, a national campaign, but with uh, very much a local flavour to it. Uh, and as you, as you will have possibly noticed, the local situ uh, local um, uh, awareness uh, campaign simultaneously. That will include you know, all the things you'd expect to see around uh, a national uh, campaign ahead of winter. Okay, um, thanks. It's, it's Andy, I can perhaps help out with some of that. The, so the, um, we've been producing a communications and engagement plan which is going through sort of regional approval and the, a lot of the materials, methods that we've put forward are starting to become the national way of addressing things and that's been developed between the comms teams across the system because we have a, an integrate uh, we have a, an integrated communications team um, and Marie has been holding the ring uh, on that plan at the moment uh, with contributions from everybody um, so we're waiting on some approvals and we can share the communications plan uh, with uh, with colleagues and councillors uh, once we get that sort of signed off um, and, and but as I say, we're sort of informing the national direction on that, which is good. And similarly with the uh, equality impact assessment, we've, we that that's been a, our approach has been adopted nationally 
uh, because it was seen to be best practice. So, Thank you. positive. Thanks, Thank you. I think that's a really useful update. Has it, if anybody um, has any further comments or questions, please give them now. Otherwise, um, I'm not really proposing to do anything too much on the work stream because uh, I, th I think that's uh, more a matter for Stephen when he's here. Um, uh, but just to sort of note where we're up to, to on that, unless anybody's got any burning um, things that they want to sort of raise at this stage. I'm taking silence as, uh, as, as not, uh, in which case all that remains, I think, is to thank everybody for their contributions. And I think to observe that there is a, an awful lot of um, goodwill, um, strength of belief and um, commitment to, to working together to, to solve some of these really significant uh, challenges that we uh, that we face uh, to recognize what's going on and working well but uh, to sort of share our appetite for tackling some of the big stuff that's coming up so thank you very much thanks thank you chair thanks chair thank you. give you a wave <laughs> thank you <laughs> afternoon thank you rebecca bye stay well everyone bye, -bye. bye. see you